Okay, I'm sitting here this afternoon. Uh, it's Friday, November 20th. I'm here in the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center. I'm here in an interview with Judge Horace Ward, uh, Morehouse College. Good afternoon, Judge Ward. Good afternoon to you, and it's just Ms. Crawford. It's just an honor to be able to interview you. Let's start out, Judge Ward, by talking about your years growing up in LaGrange, Georgia. Tell us about your childhood and any recollections you have from that period. Uh, yeah, I'm a <clears throat> native of LaGrange and I stayed down there until I finished high school. Uh, I stayed my early years with my grandparents and then I moved in with my mother and my stepdaddy and uh, uh, my heroes in LaGrange were teachers and preachers. As a matter of fact, one of my high school teachers uh, recommended that I go to Mohouse College. I didn't know anything about Mohouse at the time. So I stayed down there until 1946 and I finished high school in 1946 and uh, came on to uh, Atlanta in 46 to 10 Morehouse College. What uh, influenced you to come to Morehouse? Well, uh, uh, one of my high school teachers, I don't remember her name, I think it was, her name was Miss Hines. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about schools. I didn't know anything about Mohouse except Dr. Benny Mays had had spoken at uh, my commencement address when I was not my ad commencement, but when when I was a junior, and then a, a Mohouse man graduate spoke. <laughs> at my graduation, I don't remember his name. I think he was a reverend from North Carolina. So, as I stated earlier, this high school teacher, I think her name was Bessie Hines, recommended that I come to Mohouse College. So I did, and they granted me uh, A tuition scholarship for the first semester. And that's how I got here. What did you major in? Uh, well, I, I, I majored in uh, history, majored in history and minored in business administration. Now, do you remember any teachers, any faculty members who stood out? You mentioned Dr. Mays as president. Do you have any stories from those years that you can call up that might that tell us a bit about what you thought about the college at that time? <clears throat> yeah, well, my major professor was uh, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, can't think of his first name now. He had a son that went to Harvard and became a lawyer. And then my most interesting, interesting professor was Robert Ro Dr. Robert Brisbane, who taught political science. And then I remember E.B. E. Williams, who taught economics and business administration. And uh, Professor Roche from Haiti, who taught French. That's about all I can remember from right now. How did you de what de how did you determine that you wanted to be a lawyer? Well, uh, down in Lagrange, we had an NAACP chapter, and a lawyer from Atlanta came down and spoke in one of the churches. Uh, Attorney A.T. Walden, Walden, we call him the Colonel. 
and uh, he uh, he explained how he had become interested to, in studying law. He was from Fort Valley, Georgia, and he came to Atlanta University and got his undergraduate degree, and then he went on up to Michigan and got his uh, law degree. And he became a lawyer first in Macon, and he moved to Atlanta in, I believe, in about 1919. So when I heard his story down in LaGrange, I said, if he can do it, I probably can become a lawyer too. That was when I was in high school. So you left Morehouse, you graduated in 1959, is that right? No, 1946. 46. 46. I graduated from Morehouse in 1959, 46. And when you left Morehouse, you went on to AU. Atlanta yeah, I went University. on to Atlanta University. And then I majored in political science. And my, the chairman of the Department of Political Science was Dr. William Madison Boyd. He had a PhD from Michigan. So I got a master's uh, from AU got my bachelor's in 1950, and my master's in 1951. Tell us a bit about William Madison Boyd and his influence on you. Well, he was, uh, in addition to being a chairman of the political science department at Atlanta University, he was president of the state, the Georgia State NAACP. <coughs> so uh, I told him that I was interested in go going to law school. He said, well, come on back to me, Horace, and whenever you're ready, and I'll help you as much as I can. So after I finished Atlanta University, in 1950, I went back to Dr. Boyd and we secured an application for admission to the University of Georgia. It was too late to go that year uh, to go in uh, to start out in uh, So you applied to UGA Law School. Yeah. Okay, so you made, after you graduated from Morehouse at AU, uh, that was 1950, was that right? You what? You applied to UGA Law School. 1951. 51. Uh-huh. So when you applied, what happened immediately? After you put in your, you were the first African American to apply to the school period. As far as I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, we somehow secured an application, didn't have to put race on there. <laughs> and uh, uh, I filed the application and uh, what they did in those days, if a, if a black person filed application to one of the uh, white colleges or universities. They would send it to the Board of Regents. That's the governing body of the University of Georgia. So they sent my application over there. And the uh, secretary of the Board of Regents, I don't remember his name. So they sent me an application for out of state aid. Out of state aid was uh, something that the southern states not only Georgia, but others. Uh, if a black student applied to one of their universities or college, they would offer him, out, him or her out-of-state aid 
so they could go to any college in the North or in Howard University, and they would pay the difference between going to University of Georgia and going to uh, one of these schools. I, did, I turned it down and told them I want to go to the University of Georgia. And then what happened after that? Well, after that. Because there was a lot of back and forth and subterfuge and a right. lot of maneuvering to try to tr not uh, admit you to the school. So, That's true. Um, so uh, uh, when I turned down out of state aid and told them I want to go, that was uh, in the summer or the fall of 1951. So I didn't get hear back from them until June of 1950, 1952. And so how and, and the letter that they wrote me didn't say much. It said, Mr. Ward, your application has been received and is hereby denied. So we kept trying to get, trying to get some uh, answers and we didn't get them. So Dr. Boyd went and, and got uh, attorney A.T. Walden to represent me. And he wrote letters over there. <clears throat> in the meanwhile, I got a job teaching school in Mobile, Alabama, uh, at the uh, at a junior college down there. <clears throat> and after I went there for a year, then I asked for an interview. And. Uh, They granted me an interview in September of 1951 or September of 1952. And we, Dr. Boyd drove me up to Athens. And then I was interviewed by Three, three, three people. D dean of the law school, uh, one of the professors of the law school, and one of the professors in the graduate school. I don't remember their name, but a dean, I think it was Dean Hirsch. And uh, while I was there, they say, Mr. Ward, say, we noticed that your letters have been very carefully written. I said, they say, did you write them? I said, no, not completely. I had help. Say, who was that help? Say, it was Dr. Boyd and Attorney Walden. Both of them were graduates of, of uh, Michigan. He said, well, that's so good and so well and good. <laughs> Say, we would like for you to write a little statement why you chose the University of Georgia. I said, do you always require that? He said, no, we haven't, but we plan to. So they gave me some paper, and I told them, give me some carbon copy so I can make a copy from myself. So I wrote the reasons. I don't remember all of them. And I kept a copy of it. <clears throat> and 
And Dr. Boyd drove me back to Atlanta. I caught a plane and went on back to my teaching job in Mobile. And for the rest of the year, we tried to get some information. <clears throat> so then they added requirements. They added one that uh, in order to get into the law school, I needed to have a graduate of the law school to endorse my application, but I knew no graduates. Or, in addition to that, I need to get the Superior Court judge of my county to sign my application. So I did, got, I got a Superior Court judge to sign it, and I sent it in. <coughs> so uh, we waited another year, and we didn't hear anything about it. And then they added some requirements. That's when I found out that they needed a, you had to have a law school graduate to endorse your application. So we didn't get any, we didn't get any, any, uh, we didn't hear from him. So in 1952, Judge Walden filed a lawsuit in the United States District Court here in Atlanta, the Northern District of Georgia. And uh, so we waited for about a year Nineteen fifty three I told the uh well sometime during the during nineteen fifty three they uh they did set up an interview for me in, with me in Atlanta and the interview was conducted with a court reporter, and they had a court reporter. And it was held at the old Georgia State University. And there, Walden came to represent me. And they asked me a lot of different questions, particularly why I wasn't in the Army. And I said, well, I'm not in the Army because I'm 4F. I had a, had a hernia. And uh, they asked me, uh, where did I get the operation? I'd gotten in Mobile. So I told them. And they said, where are you teaching? I'd already told my lawyer, A.T. Walden, that I didn't want to answer that. And he uh, told them that on the advice of counsel, I, uh, <coughs> advised Mr. Ward not to answer. So I went on back to Mobile to teach school. And uh, went on back and teach school. 
And while I was teaching school down there, I had the hernia operated and repaired. And that would have been in, in uh, Nineteen sixty three. Now you were drafted to the Korean War. Yeah. After I told him told them that I had had the honey repaired and that would have been in nineteen fifty three. So uh then that's when they drafted me. 1953 and sent me to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where I had my basic training. They saw I already had a master's degree, so they didn't give me the <coughs> they didn't give me the 16 months of basic training. They gave me 16 months of basic training and 16 months of clerical training. And then they sent me on up to uh, Fort Monmouth, New, G New Jersey. And I stayed there for a year. And from there, they, they sent me to Seattle, Washington, and all the way to Korea. So I stayed in Korea for a year and got out in 1955 and went back to Mobile and taught one more year. In 1956, I got married in the Episcopal Church to Ruth LaFleur Johnson. And uh, then uh, one of the deans of Atlanta, Alabama, Alabama State came back and told me that I would not be invited to come back that summer. They had learned about my operation and they knew about that. Did they also know about the Pending lawsuit? Huh? Did they also know about the yeah, lawsuit? Yeah, that, that, that's why they didn't renew my application. So all this time, the lawsuit is still kind of stalling right there. Right. Then what happens? Well, I went on and completed my application to Northwestern University. <coughs> In uh, 1956, and I was admitted to Northwestern in uh, May or June <coughs> of 1946. And I stayed there three years until 1949, and I graduated with a law degree. So tell us the outcome of the University of Georgia case. Well, I, I never got admitted. So I went on to University of Georgia, got a law degree, came back to Atlanta, <coughs> and joined the Don Hollowell Law Firm. At that time, Don Hollowell was already representing Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes. And they had already applied to the University of Georgia. <coughs> so he added me as co-counsel. And, uh, and Vernon Jordan, you remember him? Yes. Yeah, he was already working for Hollowell, they wasn't admitted to the bar then. 
It was his law clerk. So we would drive up to Athens every day, five days a week, to uh, represent Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes. And after a week, they called Hamilton Holmes to the stand. And uh, uh, Hollowell thought it would be beneficial to the case if I would conduct the direct examination of Hamilton Holmes. So I did that. <coughs> and uh, And after that, the dean took the stand. And uh, Hollowell asked the dean of the law school, did he recognize me? He said, yeah, I recognize him. I, I recognize Horace Ward. And uh, did, you, did you know that he went to Northwestern? Yeah, I went. Yeah, I knew that. He said, that was a pretty good school, wasn't it? <laughs> <coughs> so the case was being heard by uh, W. William A. Boodle out of Macon. See, Anthony was in the Macon in, in his jurisdiction. So he heard the case. And by that time, Hollowell, it was Hollowell, Walden, and Constance. He brought in Constance Baker Motley, Motley to help out. And uh, the long and short of it, at the end of the case, on a Friday, Boodle took the case under advisement, and uh, Hollowell and I flew to New York to get with Constance Baker Mudley to write post-trial briefs. We wrote them and filed them. And uh, Judge Boodle ordered our admission into the law school. And uh, while we went to the University of Georgia, Vernon Jordan, myself, and Hollowell to take Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes to register them. The state of Georgia went back to Macon to file a stay of stay of execution to keep the keep the injunction from becoming final. And we went on up to the campus. Vernon escorted uh, Charlene Hunter, and I escorted Hamilton home. And we took them to the various schools, Hamilton to the med school, and Charlene Hunter to the School of Journalism. And while we were there, the judge in uh, Macon granted a stay of execution, which held up. which stayed uh, their application so they couldn't go. So we went on back to Atlanta. And while we were there, Hollowell, 
Vernon Hollowell and and I mean Donald Hollowell and Vernon Jordan drove to Macon, and the judge refused to to uh, vacate the stay. So we appealed it to the Fifth Circuit, and they refused. So then we appealed it already to the Supreme Court in the United States. And Jack Greenberg, who then was the, who has succeeded Thurgood Marshall as a gen general counsel of the, of the Defense Fund, he went to Washington, D.C. And the judges, Supreme Court judges, vacated the state. So then Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes went on and registered at the University of Georgia. What did it feel like to work with people like Thurgood Marshall, Constance Baker Motley, Donald Hollowell as a young Attorney. Yeah, it was uh, it was eye opening. Uh, I went to work for Don Hollowell. He paid me fifty dollars a week, and Vernon Jordan was his law clerk, and uh, I enjoyed working with him. He already had a had a law office. So he set me up in his law office, and then he he uh, showed me how to file an application in court, and he also showed me how to search titles for a real estate transaction. And. Uh, That was uh, really something. So uh, uh, and Constance Baker Modley was uh, she was a civil rights expert. She knew a lot about the law. So I learned a lot from them. You've been involved with some very, very significant cases. We talked about Holmes v. Danner right. earlier. So now let's talk about King v. State of Georgia in 1960, the case involving Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. okay. Tell us about your work on that case. <coughs> Martin Luther King, <coughs> by, <ni> by 1960, King had moved from Montgomery <coughs> to Atlanta, Georgia. He's already married Coretta. They had two children. <coughs> and uh, there was a white lady who wrote books and novels. Lillian Smith. Huh? Lillian Smith. Right. So she came, came to Martin Luther King's home or church, and he drove her back to DeKalb County. And on the way back, he was stopped by the DeKalb County police. We think because he had this white woman in the front seat. But they stopped him and they looked at his tag, Alabama tag, and they asked him for his driver's license and he showed it to him. They said, Mr. Mr. King, so, so your Alabama tag, that is your tag on the car, back of the car, has it expired? He said, you're supposed to get it 
renewed within six weeks when you move to a new state. So they gave him a ticket, told him to report to the uh, state court in the Cab County. No, as a matter of fact, they arrested him and they took him to the Fulton County J Jail. And by that time, you had students who had sat in at Rich's department store and was arrested. And they went in the Fulton County Jail. <coughs> so, Hollowell and Walden, they went to uh, before the, the mayor, Mayor Hartsfield, and he negotiated a deal where all the students were let out by signing their own bond. But Martin Luther King, he asked him, did he want to stay? He said, no, I'm not going to go out on bond. So they got out. The next morning, the sheriff of DeKalb County came and transferred Martin Luther King from the Fulton County Jail to the DeKalb County Jail. <coughs> and a day or so later, they had his trial. His trial was not for violating the law, but for violating his probation. See, he was on probation from that, that traffic ticket that he had. So Hollowell and I went out there to represent him and heard it before Jerry Judge, J. Oscar Mitchell. And after the, uh, at the end of the case, Dr. Mitchell sentenced uh, Dr. King to something like uh, three months on the public works and three months in prison. So they took Martin Luther King back to jail and the next morning, Hollowell and I were going to going to file a, file a writ of habeas corpus to get him out of jail. And we drove out to DeKalb County. <coughs> and we found out he was no longer there. Hey, Mr. Hollowell, so your client is on his way to Reedsville. Reedsville is, this, is the state maximum security prison. He, so they drove him all the way to Reedsville. So we are, we tried to get some help from from Washington, D.C., and somebody informed President John Kennedy about Martin Luther King's plight and his suffering of his wife. So at the urging of one of his assistants, Dr. King called, 
Coretta King. And he told her that he knew about her husband being in prison and that he was shocked by it. By that time, she was pregnant again. So he said, he, we'll do whatever we can to help. John Kennedy's brother, Bobby Kennedy, was by that time, he was the Attorney General. <coughs> he didn't like that at all. So he called, he called Judge Mitchell in DeKalb County. And after talking with Bobby Kennedy, Judge Mitchell granted bond for Dr. King, who was in Reedsville. And the same day or the next day, the newspaper people wanted to interview King, and they rented two airplanes. And that's Hollowell. Could they interview him? He said, yeah, you can interview him if you would rent a plane for me. So Hollowell and the news people uh, flew down to Reedsville, Georgia. And uh, Dr. King was released and flew back to Atlanta. In the meanwhile, we checked the law And we found that his appeal, he had six months. I don't know whether it was six weeks or six months, but he had some time to appeal this case to the Court of Appeals of Georgia. So we appealed this case <clears throat> to the Court of Appeals of Georgia, and they reversed the decision said it was a legal decision and sent it back to the Cab County. And when he got back out there, the judge just required him to pay a $25 fine and released him. So that was the end of that. We went on back to law practice. King continued his uh, civil rights uh, work until he was assassinated in Memphis. I don't remember the date, but he was only 39 years old. He never got to be 40. So that's the end of it. Miss Crawford. Did you know him as a student when, at Morehouse? Yeah, I did. He was one year younger than me, but he was one year ahead of me. I finished Morehouse in uh, 1949. He finished Morehouse in 1948. And then I got to see him around Atlanta and got to know him pretty well. Meanwhile, he had already gone up to Crozer Theological Seminary and got a BD degree and went to Boston College or Boston University, one or the other, and, and got a PhD in religion. And there he met Coretta Scott King. And they married and moved first to Mobile, in the, I mean Montgomery, and then to Atlanta. 
What do you What did you think of him as a as a leader? As a, huh? What did you think of his leadership? And well, he was the premier civil rights leader of our time, and I thought he, I thought he did a great job. Well, there's lots more we could talk about um, because you became, and we'll bring it to a close after this, but you became the second state senator in, the, in Georgia since Reconstruction. Yeah. Uh, so I do want to close with you sharing a bit about that. The first one was Senator Leroy Johnson. Right. And you were the second. Right. So if you would share a little bit from that period uh, because you've had an illustrious career. Okay. I mean, uh, you, you were elected to uh, first African American on the Supreme Superior Court, right? Well, first I was a state senator for about 10 years and I uh, served in the state senate with Jimmy Carter, who uh, later became governor of Georgia. And when Jimmy Carter became governor of Georgia, I served with him for almost four years. In three and a half years, he appointed me to the civil court of Fulton County in 1974. And I stayed there. The next governor, Busby, elevated me to the Superior Court. And in 1979, Jimmy Carter, as president, appointed me to the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. And that's where I sat for 32 years. That's about it, Ms. Crawford. Okay. Well, we certainly appreciate your coming over, Judge Ward, uh, again, and it's been an honor to, to interview you. Okay. Thank you so very much. Okay.